Well, good evening, my friends and fellow lovers of the Bible. I am grateful for you joining me. We're going to be studying Revelation chapter 7, verses 9 through 14, as you see on your screen in front of you. But I wanted to give you a little explanation about the background and maybe even background noise that you can hear from my grandson as he runs around out there in the other room. We, uh, every year, have a massive blessing that's given to us, a very generous uh, con family of contributors. Uh, they have a lake house in Cherokee Village, uh, Arkansas, and uh, every year they allow us to come up here for about four or five days, and we have what our family has dubbed as Thanksmas. Years ago, uh, when Bryson was was sweet on Victoria, and then they decided to get married, we realized that, you know, our family, as it expands, that the holiday season could be just a little weird. And uh, we, we don't want to, we don't want the holiday season to be too uh, conflicted, as it were, you know, and having to fight over you coming to my fam family this year, going to that family, you know, that kind of stuff. It just, you know, it kind of ruins the holiday season. So what we decided to do was we decided to combine Thanksgiving and Christmas, put it into one, Thanksmas, and around the 1st of December, we try to find a place. Well, the last four years, we've been we've been blessed to be here. And we, we come to this spot, and uh, we just enjoy Thanksgiving and Christmas all sandwiched together. And we're staying in the same house. It's just really a joy. Really, And we, th this contributing couple is just phenomenally generous and uh, so very, very thankful. Hi, Debbie Hinkle down there in Louisiana. Hope you're getting a little cooler or colder. No, I don't want you cold. I don't want it cool. What is the other one? Warmer, that's the one. I want you to have warmer weather down there because it's cold up here. We had sleet today. Uh, anyhow, thank you for joining me, Debbie. Anyhow, so we're in Cherokee Village, and uh, Gabriel, and uh, Gabriel's, he's sweet on a young lady, and she's actually with us, and uh, we're really thankful for that. And, of course, Bryson and Victoria, they're married, and they got a little boy, 4 o'clock, 4 o'clock, 4 years old, who's out there who you can probably hear just tearing things up. And uh, just, anyhow, just a, it's a wonderful family time, and we're thankful, and I'm thankful that you have joined us for, joined me, for a, a few moments here in the bedroom, uh, trying to get away from the chaos out there so we can study the book of Revelation. Anyhow, let's get after this thing, okay? Let's take that off the screen and we'll bring this one up. I want to do just a moment of review before we go into uh, verses 9 through 14, which is the, the text for this evening. But up on the top left-hand corner here, you're, you're seeing the continuation of the text. Now, I realize it's a cluttered screen, and I apologize for that, but I realized tonight it was going to have to be somewhat like that because I, there's only a limited amount of stuff that I can get on the screen in order for you to see it. But I wanted you to see that. I'll expand it for just a second, okay? Hi, David. Good to see you, bro. Thank you. Hope everything's good up there in the Louisville area. I'll expand that for just a second so you can see it. Revelation 7, beginning at verse 1, you see that after this I saw four angels standing, etc. And then it says in verse 4 that there's going to be 144,000 sealed from every tribe of the sons of Israel. All right, that's the, the context I want you to see because then you get into verses 5 and following and it lists these 12 tribes. Then there's a transition into verse 9 that says, After this I looked and saw it, etc. And there's going to be this great multitude coming out of the great tribulation. Now let me take that back so that I can see you guys and you can see me. All right, my point for, for going there is this. In this particular text, we are seeing somewhat of a transition. I think it's two different groups of people. But whatever it is, it's important for us to recognize that what's taking place seems to be taking place Basically, in the tame, same time frame, you know what, what's taking, what's happening here. In a moment, I'm going to put up a slide up here that'll show you the the timeline as presented in Matthew chapter 24. But by review, by way of review from last week, remember the 144,000 that you have there in the top right hand corner. I'm having trouble seeing it myself, so I'm going to. All right, the 144,000, and they're designated here. They're designated as the sons of Israel. I, I, I'm not debating that. I mean, that's what the Holy Spirit says, so it's definitely the sons of Israel. But at the same time, it's not the sons of Israel, at least in the classical sense, as I shared with you last week. You'll notice that, that block there. Let's see if I can get my finger here so you can see right there. That one right there. See that block? Um, there's, there's several reasons we know that these are not the literal listing. It's not the literal listing of the sons of Israel, one of which is it's missing Dan. He's a, one of the one of the, the twelve tribes. But it's also including Manasseh, who is not a son of Israel. He's a grandson of Israel, and so in that sense, you know, I don't think the Bible's contradicting itself at all. But it's just an interesting list. It's not the list that you would see if the Holy Spirit was trying to convey to us the exactness of the Jewish lineage from old. 
It's not that list. In fact, you see the second part down there. there these are not even, this is not even a list of those who inherited land in the promised land, okay? Because, again, Dan is missing. Levi is included. We know that Levi did not inherit land because Levi is the priestly tribe, right? So they didn't inherit land. And then Joseph is listed rather than his two sons. Well, actually, one son, Manasseh, is listed, but Ephraim is not listed. So all I'm trying to say by way of review from last week is that Whatever you do with this list, know this. It is not the exact classical list of old. For whatever reason, the Holy Spirit felt like that he needed to tweak this list, trade, kind of trade it up a little bit, uh, have a grandson listed rather than, you know, what he's trying to get our attention. I don't know, I don't know all the answers here, but he's trying to get our attention to recognize that what's happening here, although probably indicating Israel in some respect, it's not classical Israel. It's not the it, so you can't take this passage and literally say that he has given us the literal twelve tribes of Israel because he didn't. Dan is missing, Manasseh is included, etc. It, it's just simply not that. Another thing I think is interesting is that Judah is listed first. That of course is the tribe from which the Messiah is going to come. Is that indicative of something? I think it might be, especially given the transition between verses eight and nine. In verses 5 through 8, we've got the listing of these tribes, and there's 12,000 from it. Add it all together, you get 144,000, etc. But they're not the exact tribes, remember. Okay, it's not the exact list. Dan's missing, Manasseh's included, etc. Okay, so whatever he is doing, the Holy Spirit that is, in verses 5 through 8, he's giving us a, an indicator that references Israel, but is not exactly Israel, the 12 tribes of Israel. Uh, it's very important that we understand that. Then as you go into verse 9, we're going to see a listing, excuse me, not a listing, instead of a listing, we're going to see just a general comment about an innumerable amount of people that are coming out of the Great Tribulation. That's important for us to recognize as well. In fact, let's just go there so you can see that particular text. I don't keep you bewildered about that. All right. So in, in the text that we want to talk about this evening, now we're getting in to verse 9, Okay. He's going to say, after this I looked and behold a great multitude. After what? After the 144,000 were marked by God. Okay, they're sealed by God. After that, then he sees this great multitude that no one could number. It's just it's so big that nobody can even put a number to it. And they come from every nation, from all tribes, from people's languages, standing before the throne and before the land, clothed with white robes with palm branches in their hands. We'll come back to that. And crying out with a loud voice, salvation belongs to our God who sits on the throne and to the Lamb. And all the angels were standing around the throne and around the elders and the four living creatures, and they fell on their faces before the throne and worshipped God. On my Sunday morning times, in my sermon time, in Lord's Day Live, we're talking about holiness. And I reference this very concept that in the presence of God, holy, holy, holy is constantly being repeated, and people are constantly falling on their faces before this grand God, the only real true God, God himself, and they are giving him the homage that he deserves because he is holy. Well, here you see that playing out. you got the 24 elders, four living creatures, and everything else that's out there, and they're constantly falling on their face before God because he is that holy. If he is that holy and we are called to be holy, Peter tells us that in 1 Peter, if we're called to be like him, then we need to recognize what holiness means. Join me on Sunday mornings, Lord's Day Live, and you can find out more about that. And they're crying out, okay, move on down here to what is it, four living creatures, and they fell on their faces, etc. Verse 12, saying, Amen, blessing and glory and wisdom and thanksgiving and honor and power and might be to our God forever and ever. Amen. 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 Right? Okay. Then verse 13. Then one of the elders is an odd text. One of the elders addressed me saying, who are these clothed in white robes and from where have they come? It's an odd text because he's going to ask a question. John's going to basically say to him, you already know the answer. And then the angel sure enough, or the, excuse me, the elder sure enough is going to give him the answer. Why do we have this exchange? I don't know, except to suggest perhaps that even in the heavenly realm, there is an, there's an exchange that takes place. And John has progressed, now we're into the seventh chapter, he evidently has progressed to a spot where he's a little more comfortable, perhaps, in the heavenly realm, in this revelation state that he is in, and he's comfortable enough that he is actually able to say to the elder, you already know the answer to your own question. Read it again, verse 13. Then one of the elders addressed me, saying, who are these uh, clothed in white robes, and from where have they come? I said to him, sir, you know. And he said to me, these are the ones coming out of the great tribulation. They have washed their robes and made them white in the blood of the Lamb. 
the Great Tribulation. I'm going to throw up another slide here at the bottom of that one so you can see. This is the timeline from Matthew chapter 24. Most of you know, if you've been with me very long, that I am big, big, big on letting the Bible interpret the Bible. I feel like it's the safest way to, to do things. If you let God tell you what God is saying, at the end of the day, what are you going to have? God. And so if we let the Bible, which is written by God, tell us what the Bible is saying, written by God, at the end of the day, what are you going to have? The Bible, which is written by God. And so if we, if we just allow the Bible to harmonize with itself, to be the great commentary on itself, we're going to end up with good things. All right, now, Matthew chapter 24, you're familiar with this. We've talked about it in the past, but in Matthew 24, Jesus is being presented with a, a question. When is this going to take place? You might recall that they just walked out of the, the temple compound area, and the, the disciples are all enamored with how big it is and fancy and all of that kind of thing. And Jesus makes an, a shocking statement. He says, there's a day coming that there won't be one rock left upon another. Well, this really puzzles them. As they go down into the Kidron Valley up the other side, then eventually they're going to have a conversation. They finally get to a point where they can ask Jesus, well, when is this going to take place? And Jesus then in Matthew 24 and 25, but primarily 24, he's going to explain the end times to them. This is why Matthew 24, this is why I am so big on the microcosm, macrocosm interpretation of Scripture. I think that what we actually have happening in Matthew 24, because it's a really confusing passage, in a lot of it, he's clearly addressing a day when the, the great boulders on which the temple is built are, are not going to be on top of each other. It's going to be torn down. When does that happen? A.D. 70. That's when Titus comes through, right? The destruction of Jerusalem. He's clearly referencing some of that. But then he is clearly referencing the son of the return, the, the return of the Son of Man as, as well, because he goes on to talk about that. It's like he's blending two things, and scholars have for centuries tried to divide this out. I am of the opinion that instead of trying to divide it out, you need to recognize that what's happening here is he's actually talking about both events. I think that there will be a time in the future where we're going to see a lot of the stuff that's talked about in Matthew 24 in a very cataclysmic kind of a way that's going to play out. But I think it also did already play out in AD 70 when Jerusalem fell in a lesser way. It's the microcosm of a macrocosm kind of fulfillment of Scripture. All right, that, that's, that's history that we've already covered, but it's important that you see that. So if you go to Matthew 24, which does not contradict Revelation chapter 7 or any other prophecy for that matter, when you go to Matthew chapter 24, you see this timeline. And I believe it's a timeline that's laid out as the Holy Spirit wanted it to be laid out so that you and I could recognize things as they happen in order. Without going into great detail about the timeline, I mean, you can see it there on the screen yourself, I want you to notice that there's actually two sections of tribulation that take place. And, and even Daniel re references some of this. There is a period of tribulation that's just that, tribulation. And then there comes a time, and we see it referenced here in Revelation chapter 7, we also see it re re referenced in Matthew ch chapter 24, there comes a time when it is no longer called tribulation, but the great tribulation. In fact, Jesus will describe it as a tribulation that has never been paralleled before and will never be paralleled after. And so it's a great tribulation. As I understand Matthew 24 play out, it sounds to me what's taking place is that the first half of tribulation general is a, gen is a, is a tribulation that comes about with man-on-man -man wrath. It's, it's persecution. Man persecutes, man, uh, persecutes man, largely because of, you know, some of them are righteous, whatever it may be. But there's a persecution man on man. But when you get to the abomination of desolation, Matthew 24, verse 15, when you get to the abomination of desolation being set up in the holy place, whatever that is, there is a transition from general tribulation to God tribulation, God wrath, okay? There are many, especially in the premillennial world, there are many who believe that the church will be out of here prior to that. I'd like to think so. I don't know. They don't either. But to, uh, one, of the, <coughs> excuse me, one of the reasons that they would say that is because they know that the church is not destined for God's wrath. Completely buy into that. that God, the church is not, but that does not mean just because we are not destined for, we're not going to be the focal point of God's wrath, we're not going to be the purpose of God's wrath, that doesn't mean that you and I will not necessarily endure the side effects, if you will. I'll give you an illustration. When the death angel passed over the homes in ancient Egypt, remember the last of the plagues? When the death angel passes over the homes of the Jews, who, of the ancient Hebrews, who have the blood on their doorframe, etc., 
They escape the wrath of God because it was not intended for them. The wrath that is coming down from God was intended for Egypt. But they lived through the wrath of God, even though they themselves were not the focal point of the wrath of God. They didn't lose their firstborn, etc., etc. That is true. But they did, no doubt, hear the screams of all of the families round about them. They did recognize that people that they were close to in the Egyptian culture had lost their firstborn. All of those kinds of things. So they, they did journey through the wrath of God, although they were not the focal point of the wrath of God. I think that if we, again, allow the Bible to interpret the Bible, that it seems consistent that God could be that way. That God could be an, a God who, even in the future, that middle black part, <coughs> that there could be many of us in the church who have to live through that, although we are not the focal point of that. It seems to me that in the opening section, that first half, that it is likely that the church could be, or that, that, that faithful people could be the focal point. What premillennialists, the, most premillennialists do, is they want to have a pre-tribulation rapture. Okay? I don't call it rapture, I call it the call it up, because rapture is not in the Bible. But uh, it, it's the same concept. It's the idea of, the, of, the, of us being removed from the setting. They like to dominate their thinking with a pre tribulation In other words, it would be before the gray section that you see there, all right? certainly before the black section. A pre-tribulation rapture would be before the gray, before the, the, the seven starts at all. There's going to be a, a rapture, they would say. All of which I hope is true, okay? But when you understand this text, I'm getting there eventually, Revelation chapter 7, and you tie it to Matthew chapter 24, it sounds to me that it is also equally possible that there could be a mid-tribulation rapture or caught-upness uh, as far as the church is concerned, okay? <clears throat> we are clearly told by Jesus himself, to watch for the abomination of desolation, whatever that is. I suspect that there probably was a fulfillment of that back during the fall of Jerusalem, and I think that there will be a f another fulfillment of that in a macrocosm kind of a way in, in the days yet to come. But that seems to be the marker, and he seems to tell the faithful, look for that. If we're to look for that, and yet we're not here because we've been caught up already, then it sounds like that the admonition is wasted upon us somewhat. Secondarily, it seems to me that as you begin to recognize the commonality between Revelation chapter 7 and Matthew 24 with regards to the Great Tribulation, it seems logical to me that we, we can see in this that there are still faithful who are being represented. A lot of people like to argue that the church is, you know, once you leave chapter 3, that you don't hear the church, hear the church again until you get to the end of the book. I'm not sure that's true. In fact, I believe that our text this evening could easily be representing the church, okay? So I'm not sure that the, the idea of being caught up, I, I'm definitely not sure that that's going to be pre-tribulation. And I'm not so sure, but it might be mid-tribulation or, here's this is going to shock everybody, I can easily see how it could be later on in the tribulation, perhaps even at the end of the tribulation. That this, that, so it's a post tribulation, uh, post uh, rapture, post tribulation rapture or caught up experience. I think any of those are very, very possible. And frankly, I think that some of us need to stop preaching as an absolute certainty that before it all hits the fan, we're going to be gone because it just it's weakening the church. I'm not saying that won't happen, but it's it's, it's helping us to be complacent and not prepare. I think that there's very, very good chance that the church is in for some very, very dark days. And we need jelly for backbone kind of preachers, especially those who are preaching as an absolute certainty that we are going to be caught up before tribulation begins. They're, I don't think they're doing a service to the church. I think that we need to make sure that our people recognize it is possible that we're going to have to live through some dark days. All right, now that you've got that in your mind, I want to come back to the text that is at the top, okay? As you get down here to verse 13, We've got this elder, and he's having this discussion with John, and I've already talked about how interesting that is. But he is going to he's going to identify that these folks that John is seeing are the ones who are coming out of the Great Tribulation, that black section that I've got listed there at the bottom of your screen. They're coming out of the, not the Tribulation, they're coming out of the Great Tribulation. Something that's unique there, which I have designated as God's wrath, rather than man's wrath on man. So these are the folks who are coming out of the, I mean, he says it, not me, the Great Tribulation tribulation. But I also need you to, under, to recognize that in this text, it's not just a handful. We have got a massive amount of people who are coming out of the great tribulation who have washed their robes. They're converts. They have come to the Lord. 
the Great Tribulation period is going to be a massive revival on the planet. Now, everybody would like to think, in the premillennial world at least, they'd like to think that that massive revival is largely going to come about because of the 144,000 or the Jew is going to be called back to God. I don't know if that's the case. I'm not saying that they won't be involved, but what I am saying is that I think via numbers that you see here, it's interesting to me that as you, you go versus, what was it, uh, 8 through, uh, da, 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 no, it was it, 5 through 8. Versus 5 through 8, we list the 12 tribes. It's, it gives us a specific number. 144,000. But when he gets to this group in verse 9, it's a multitude so vast you can't even number them. So whoever these people are that's coming out of the Great Tribulation, it's a massive number, too much, too many to number, and they are folks who've washed their robes in the blood of the Lamb. There's going to be a massive revival that's taking place. Is it possible that that massive revival could happen in the absence of the church? Sure, absolutely. But I don't think that it is likely that it's going to happen in the absence of the Holy Spirit. And when you understand that that uh, many folks believe that, that that's the one who's the great guardian that's taking place, that, that, that he has to be removed from the situation, those who, who take that perspective, and I'm not saying they're wrong, but those who take that perspective kind of leave it an odd opening here for a question, and that is, how do we have this massive group of of people who come to the Lord are converted during the Great Tribulation. He said it, not me. The Great Tribulation. They, they come about that without the, 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 the restrainer. It has been. It, how does that happen? Again, I'm not arguing necessarily one way or the other, but I am, I am trying to cast a little doubt on some of those who are preaching with absolute certainty this idea that we are caught up before there's any tribulation period taking place. I just don't see that. In fact, I think it's very, very likely that the folks being described in verses third, well, in verses nine on on here, uh, specifically down here when you get to verse thirteen and following this whole idea coming out of the great tribute, I think that could be the church. I think that could be individuals who uh, they, they're certainly Christians. They're certainly people who have washed their their robes in the in the blood, and so I, I think it could easily be. And, and the whole idea that God's not going to let His bride go through the wrath part. That's just not consistent with Scripture. God has allowed his bride to go through the wrath uh, parts throughout history, not the least of which is the fall of Jerusalem. So I, I just think we need to be really, really careful, and we need to prepare ourselves for the fact that I think it likely that the church could have to endure some, if not all, of the tribulation period. And those of us who are preaching something as a certainty other than that, I think you're softening up the church, and you're not you're not doing her any favors. All right, now that I've dealt with the end of the passage, let's go back to the beginning. I've only got a few lines here because most of this passage really is dominated by the, the wonderful things that they're saying towards the throne, and we don't have to give a lot of commentary there. All right, go, go, back, go back up to verse 9. After this, I looked, and behold, a great multitude that no one could number. That's how many it's going to be in this great this great revival that's going to happen during the great tribulation. It says that these folks were from every nation, from all tribes, people, language, standing before the throne, etc. From every nation. So you've got the 144,000, which clearly seems to reference, it's a, it's a Jewish, I have a heavily Jewish description, right? 144,000 dealing with the 12 tribes. Even though it's not specifically the 12 tribes of Israel, it's still a very heavy Jew. So it seems likely to me that the 144,000 thousand is referencing Israel in some form. <clears throat> but when you get down here to verse 9, you notice that it opens itself up then to every nation, is every language is represented. And so this seems to be an expansion. It's a lot like what I showed you in the first slide, uh, and I didn't explain it very well. Let's go back and get that and see if I can put that up there. Uh, baloney. Let's see. It's this one right here. You notice, and I didn't explain this last week, and I don't know why I skipped over it, but you see on the on the right, you've got that picture of the tree. It's supposed to look like a tree that has a limb that has been grafted in. The reason I, I've got shown you that is because it's, it's a clue that we use whenever we're trying to remember what the book of Romans is talking about in specific chapters. Well, that's the clue for Romans chapter 11, and it reminds us that the church is grafted in. The point being this. It seems to me that we need to understand that the, the tribulation period is not just about the Jew. I'm not even sure that it's primarily about the Jew. I believe that the tribulation period is about mankind. And the reason I say that is because of what you see in verses 5 through 8 in Revelation 7 and 9 through 14. 
in 5 through 8, it clearly seems to be referencing Israel. I get that, okay? But as you move then from 9 to 14, it clearly seems to be referencing everybody else, meaning that there is a great blending that took place. Remember the two, three major time periods in human history. First 2,000 years, God focused on all of humanity. But then the next 2,000 years, he makes a covenant with Abraham and he focuses in on the Jew because all of humanity ain't getting it. And so for the next 2,000 years, he focuses in on the Jew in order to preserve the lineage of Jesus. 2,000 years, so about 4,000 years now into human history, Jesus comes on the scene. When, once Jesus comes on the scene, almost immediately after his resurrection, we're going to begin to see a real transition in who is invited and focused on as far as God is concerned. The last 2,000 years of human existence has been focused on humanity, all of humanity again. First 2,000 years, all of humanity. Next 2,000, the Jew. Next 2,000, all of humanity again. Because from the beginning, God's desire has not been for the Jew. God's desire has been for all of humanity. Now, the Jew is going to have a significant part to play in bringing the open door to all of humanity. But the, the, the end game has always been all of humanity. That's why I find it a little bit troublesome, at least in my eschatology, to think of the tribulation period as being specifically for the Jew. I just don't. I think that the, the tribulation period is for all of humanity, Jew and Gentile alike, because of the grafting in that has taken place. All right, let's take that back off now. Come back to our passage. So notice that when you get to verse 9, we're now dealing with everybody. Prior to that, it seems like we've been dealing with Israel. Now we're dealing with all of humanity again. I think that is the purpose of the Great Tribulation and what we're going to be begin to see <coughs> Excuse me, as we, as we journey into the trumpets and then we journey into the bowls of wrath. All right, moving on. He comes on down here, then every nation and people, language, etc. And then watch it. It says that they're clothed in white robes. We'll talk about that later. But they have palm branches in their hands. When's the last time you remember palm branches being mentioned in Scripture? Yeah, triumphant entry. You remember when Jesus is coming in and they're expecting that he is going to then take and he's going to build a physical, literal kingdom. Didn't happen. And so it was an odd moment for many of them. And, and they were disappointed. A lot of folks went away and they left the, the movement, etc. But there were a handful of faithful who recognized that God's plans are often higher, much higher than man's ideas of what they think God's plans are. And so instead of trying to run ahead of God, they just let God play it out. And what God was actually indicating, evidently, in the triumphant entry, was that Jesus is coming and his kingdom will be set up, and it was. And the church is a kingdom of Jesus. And as it's being set up then, we find that Jesus reigns within his church. Present tense, that's what he is doing. Those who are called the amillennialists, which is a bad term because it suggests that they don't believe in a thousand year reign, they do. They think that we're in it right now. They believe that the thousand years is just an ex a very long period of time, symbolically speaking, and we're in it right now, Jesus reigning in his church. Very prominent view. And although I don't buy into a lot of it anymore, I, it's just dishonest and it's dirty for us to call them amillennial because they do believe in a thousand years. It's not the same kind of a thousand years that maybe you're thinking of as far as a, a literal exact thousand years, but they, and by the way, I have a pre very premillennial kind of a viewpoint now, but I don't believe in the exact thousand years. I think it's much more likely that whatever the thousand year period is referring to, and I believe it's coming, but whatever that is, I don't think it's going to be exactly a thousand years. I think it's talking about it a very, very long extended period of time. And one of the reasons I do that, again, letting the Bible interpret the Bible, is because Daniel talks about, uses the same number, a thousand, thousand times a thousand folks that are, are gathered around the throne of God. Do you think that he was literally saying that it's down to exactly a thousand times a thousand? That's the, that's the number of people? Or is he just trying to say it's just a massive number of, of folks that are there? See what I'm saying? I think the same thing is true probably of those who would like to call it the seven years of tribulation. I don't call it that because Daniel doesn't call it that. He just calls it the seven. And so seven often represents completeness. I think that there will be a complete period of tribulation that leads us into a long, 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 long time that's symbolically referenced as a thousand years of Jesus reigning. Anyhow, that's a, a whole other subject. You come back to the palm branches in, in their hands and you'll notice again you've got this idea of ushering in the kingly state of Jesus. When that first happened, microcosm, when it first happened, it was Jesus setting up his church. 
Now I believe macrocosm is going to be a time when Jesus is going to use not just the church, but he's going to use in the Gentile sense, but he's going to use a blended, uh, a blended group who are the faithful of all humanity that are going to be with him and are going to, going to continue to reign. All right, you, you come on down there and it says, verse 10, they're crying out with a loud voice. And the rest of that paragraph really deals with the glories that they're presenting to God, which you don't need me to describe for you. Then you come down to verse 13. We're almost done. Then one of the elders does that, that thing with John. And John says, well, you know the answer to your own question. And then the, the, the elders, he, he says, oh, yeah, these are the ones that are coming out of the great tribulation. Then there's that last phrase. They're not only coming out of the great tribulation, but they've been doing something during the great tribulation, which is specifically the last sentence. They have washed their robes and made them white in the blood of the Lamb. Who are these people? They're converts. These are individuals who have been washed in the blood. Where do we access the blood of Jesus? We know that in the, in, 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 in the New Testament pattern. It's in baptism. That's where we are immersed in the blood of Christ. And by allowing ourselves to access the cleansing, the ultimate cleansing agent, blood, of Jesus, we are cleansed of our sins and we come into a, a relationship with him. The only thing that I think is really, really mar remarkable for us to see before we shut this thing down is this. Once again, I say it. Whoever these people are, they are definitely two things. They are definitely coming out of the great tribulation. And number two, they are individuals who have been converted to Christ during the great tribulation. They are folks who have, I say during, they, they are coming, they have been converted either during or prior to. And the reason I'm making that qualifier is because I think it's possible some of us could be a part of that group. I did not receive Jesus as my Lord and Savior during the Great Tribulation. But uh, if I live through the Great Tribulation, I would be among this great number who come out because our, our robes have been washed in the blood of the Lamb. Now, again, I recognize that that's a little bit controversial. But as I've said before, and I, I say it again by, by conclusion, I have no loyalties to any particular position as far as eschatology is concerned. Uh, thankfully, because of people like you, I am able to continue my ministry from a very, very sincere standpoint that I just, I accept it all. I look at it all and I'm willing to. And when I say sincere, I'm not trying to be necessarily mean towards some people, but I know, I know that there are some preachers who take a premillennial view because they recognize if they take another kind of a view, they'll lose their job. I know for a fact that there are preachers who take an amillennial point of view because they believe that they'll lose their job if they take a premillennial view. I'm not doing either of them. I'm going to look at it, I'm going to question it, and I'm going to work through it, and I'm going to let the Bible explain the Bible. I have no loyalties to Grandpa because my Grandpa always taught the premillennial view. I have no loyalties there. I have no loyalties to the amillennial view either, although my father certainly would, would take that position, and I love him, and I think he's the smartest guy on the planet. I, I don't have any loyalties there because my loyalty is with the Lord and with what his book says. And so I'm willing to take it however he puts it. And if, if that means that one day I wake up and I, <coughs> I discover that I've got to take an absolutely complete uh, upside-down approach to eschatology, I'm happy to do that. I'm willing to do that. Because hear me, at the end of the day, I want to be right with God, not necessarily right with the hierarchy of his people. I want to be right with God. And you do too, I suspect. And so that's why I'm thankful that you join me on Sunday nights as we study through the book of Revelation. I pray that that's been a blessing to you. I... Uh, I have really enjoyed studying through it up to this point, and I continue to enjoy it. For those of you who are School of Biblical Studies students, let's see if I can, I'll go this way. There you see, you see right there? Let me get my finger right there. That stuff right there, those are the questions that uh, are go with the School of Biblical Studies. Those are the ones that you'll have. The reason I'm bringing that up at the end of this is this is our last Revelation study for the fall semester, and so this will be the, the text from which you will have those questions to answer And on Friday when you receive your your email, and that will be the, la the last of our Revelation study for the fall semester. I'm so thankful that you have joined us. have nine students, one of which is in India, and they have been so good and so faithful. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Whoever you are and why ever you join me, I am thankful that you have spent some time with me. I love you, I appreciate you, and my greatest wish for you, please, you be there. Matthew 16, 26.